Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 through 12. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they pleaded, and they asked his disciples, why does your math teacher eat with the collectors, the tax collectors, and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Would you just keep your finger there and raise your Bible in the air and just repeat after me, say, thank you, God, for your holy word. Tonight I will receive what God has for me, in Jesus' name, amen. So brothers and sisters, Jesus was in the process of getting his disciples, 12 men, of which one fell away, Judas. But these were going to be men that would change the world. And if we really think about this, we see that this has been an amazing thing. That in an obscure, let's not forget about Jesus being God and everything right now. He is God. But just think of it from a human perspective. He is an obscure man, Jesus. He comes out of nowhere. And, he's, and, and, and he calls 12 disciples. And these men were from different backgrounds. One was a zealot. That means he was, he, it was a party. It was a party in, in, in that time. They were z called zealots because they were zealous, militarily zealous, to take the Roman government down. If, if, if Simon the Zealot had not found Jesus, he'd probably be, you know, be fighting. The, the Romans with a sword physically. If he lived a little later, well, he probably did live that long, he would have been in Jerusalem, 70 AD, fighting the Romans. If he lived in 138, uh, 135 AD, 125, what was that again? 135, the Bar Kokhba revolt. He would have been there fighting them. So God took somebody who was politically zealous and made him on fire for Jesus. And God took a man like Peter and God anointed a fisherman. This man was not a man of education. The Bible tells us that in Acts chapter 4, they perceived that they were unlearned men. <coughs> God took a man like that. And God used Peter. God took John. John on the other hand, came from a priestly family. When you look at the Bible, he was in the courtyard when Ananias was in interrogating Jesus and John was in the courtyard. Now, nobody comes in the courtyard unless they are priests. And so John must have been from a priestly family for him to be there. Otherwise, he was not allowed in that courtyard. And we think of Thomas. Everybody calls him Doubting Thomas. I call him Believing Thomas. 
Because let me tell you, yes, he doubted Jesus in the beginning, but that's not where it ended. G Thomas eventually said, he bowed his knee and said, my Lord and my God. It was one of the most powerful ways, one of the most early affirmations of the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is God himself. He's not only the Son of God, but He's God of the Son. He's God Himself. He said, my Lord and my God. For a Jewish man to say that, to say, my Lord and my God, did not mean He was just another mighty one. He was God of the Old Testament Himself. And so we can go through them, and uh, then we get here to Matthew. Matthew was a Jewish tax collector for the Roman government. Matthew must have been so hated because you see the Roman government collected all these taxes to fund their big empire and they used, see there's a difference between publicans and tax collectors. I once thought they were the same thing. But the publicans were the, the top dogs, the big wigs, and then the tax collectors were the ones who worked for them and they employed Jewish people in Judea to work for the Roman publicans. And Matthew made a good living off of this. Zacchaeus did also. How many of you remember Zacchaeus? Yeah. Uh, they made some good money. And they would collect the taxes, but in addition they collect a little extra. Some tips, little candy tips. <laughs> Okay, so then, and they took some big tips, or whatever it might be. And, and so Matthew must have been a very hated man. But you know, Jesus must have been the most awesome man. Forget for a moment, I already said it, he's God. But let's keep it human for a while, and we'll get to the God. Imagine a man with such magnetic pull in his personality, that he could tell Peter... And John, while they working on their nets, follow me. And immediately they left their nets, left their dad in the boat, and followed Jesus. Now what makes a man do that? And here's Matthew, sitting here behind his tax collector feet. People are coming, tax collector. He's busy. Have you ever been busy and somebody interrupt you? Let me tell you. That can get me in the flesh. When I'm busy and I'm focused and somebody wants me to do something else, I don't know if it's just a man thing or what it is, or it's just me. But I tell you, when I'm focused, I want to be focused. I don't want to do two things or three things at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I want to do that thing and get it done. And so Matthew is there busy, taking, you know, all the numbers and whatever. And suddenly, here comes Jesus and looks at him. And Matthew looks up, and Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew puts his pen down, leaves the business, and follows Jesus. What makes a man do that? Because Jesus had an anointing upon him. Jesus had power upon him. Jesus had the ability to say something. Now, I want to ask you something. Won't it be wonderful when God puts that same anointing on us and we go up to a stranger on the boardwalk or a stranger somewhere somewhere in Atlanta or wherever and we walk up to them and we give them that look Jesus gave them and the fire of God burns through their soul as we look through them and we tell them follow Jesus follow Jesus follow Jesus, and they put their pen down, they put their joint down, they put their, they put their, their, their beard down, and they follow Jesus. I believe that God wants to anoint God's people to have that kind of power to bring people to Christ. Can you give the Lord a wonderful hand of praise? Hallelujah. And the Bible says it's not by might, nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. I believe that God will put that anointing upon us. No wonder the man who was sitting at the temple, 
He was lame, begging. And Peter said, look at us. He probably looked at John and said, how did Jesus look, look again? Let's put that same look on our face. Let's speak with the same tone that he had. Should we emulate Jesus? You know, I've had all kinds of heroes in my life when I was a teenager. I look back, there was an evangelist, Nicky van der Bestuizen. I tried to talk like him. Then there was Reinhard Bonke. I got a German accent overnight. Amen. I could, I could talk like Reinhard Bonke. Amen. Africa shall be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. America shall be saved. Faith frightens the devil. Amen. I mean, that's a good bonky accent right there. Amen. And then my uncle, I love my uncle. He, God, he, had a, he was a stutterer. And God baptized him with the Holy Spirit. And to this day, he still stutters. He's 81 years old. But when he takes a microphone and preaches, he's fluent. The anointing comes on him instantly, and he preaches fluent. And I remember when I was a teenager, I would <coughs> stutter like him. I would try. I wasn't a stutter, but I tried to stutter just like him because I just ad ad admired my uncle John. What a man, man of God! But you know what I learned? You can't emulate people. You got to emulate Jesus. You got to be like Jesus. Even Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. Be imitators of me as I am of Jesus. We should be like Jesus. Somebody say, we should be like Jesus. We should emulate him. We should talk like him. We should walk like him. We should act like him. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus told Matthew, follow me. And Matthew followed Jesus. Now, the Bible tells him, Matthew took him to dinner at his own home. Now, he must have had a nice home. He must have had a, a nice, you know, luxury home, very nice home. And here he goes and he, he sits in, he gets Jesus to come to his home. And with him, he has all the top big wigs, like they say, of the city. All the top tax collectors. You know, in everything, people have a good connection. Preachers like to connect with preachers. And, uh, you know, uh, nursery. People like to connect with nursery people, you know, and uh, of arborists like to connect with arborists. Tree cutters like to... My brother over here just cut a tree down. Was, see that black rug over there? Twice, Twice that, that uh, big. And he cut that thing down. The tallest one in Millsboro. Yeah, and I remember when we went to Guatemala. Was it? No, we went to Honduras. Honduras. Amen. And guess what? Of all things, they were taking a tree down. Man, you just loved it. I mean, of all, I've never seen them take a tree down. And all my place stuff. But when him and I went to Honduras, God had it that they would be taking a tree down. You were watching it. And they didn't have all the machinery you had. They had bare feet and machetes. But they brought that thing down. You know, but here's the thing. You know, uh, the tax collectors got together and they met with Jesus. Now one thing about them, the Bible says, God, the Bible connects often the publicans and tax collectors with the prostitutes. And isn't that the same today when there's money, there's women because you can pay for what you want. And you have it today, all the way in New York, Wall Street, everything is still the same thing. Still the same sin. And let me just say something about that. Don't look down on rich people. Amen? We like to look down on rich people. And we like to look at the poor people and pity them. Let me tell you, whether you're poor or whether you're rich, you are a sinner in the sight of God and you need Jesus. And like Frank Shelton, an evangelist friend of mine, he says the church has done a good job reaching the poor but hasn't done a good job reaching the powerful and the rich and the influential. God's using him mightily. He's got prayer meetings in the White House, not the White House, in the Senate and all kinds of things like that. So praise God. But how many of you know Heidi Baker? I was about to. So Heidi Baker, she 
works among the poor in Mozambique. At that time, Mozambique was the poorest country in the world. And she would work among them, work among them. And one day, somebody gave her a word. And she said, God is going to promote you. As you've been working among the poor, God's going to promote you to work among the rich. And when she heard that, she wanted to throw up. Because she thought in her mind, this is the last thing I want. I want to be among the poor. I don't want to be among the snobs. I don't want to be among the rich. I want to work among the poor. But you know what? One day she went to New York. And she walked down the street and she saw all these people with suits and ties, Wall Street types, all walking down. And she looked at them and suddenly she had a vision. And she saw them with thin arms, pale, rib cages, bloated bellies, and she realized that these people were nothing on the inside. On the outside, they had it all together, but on the inside, she saw them exactly like the people of Mozambique. And she realized, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, now that's not a promotion, by the way, the word came forth, but maybe it, maybe it wasn't. How many of you know sometimes you can give a word, but it doesn't come out exactly right? So, so that it's not like a promotion that, oh, you, you're no longer going to preach among the poor, you're going to be in a rich, among the rich now. But still, the word was, God would open the doors for her to minister to among the rich. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And she was able to see, she, she does that in a wonderful way. But my friends, you know what I'm saying here tonight? These tax collectors got together and Jesus was sitting with the tax collectors. The one thing about Jesus is he did not have a religious spirit. Neither did he have a self-righteous spirit. Because man can have a self-righteous spirit. Oh, I tell you, we can be so self-righteous and we can be so religious one day, uh, a, sh uh, a ship was going down, and they had to get water out, and w they had to take their buckets and help so the ship wouldn't go down. Back in the days, I can't remember if it was John Wesley or Charles Wesley, but one brother said, John or Charles, we need to pray. And he said, okay, you go pray while I go help taking with a bucket, get the water out. There's a time to pray, but there's a time to get your bucket out. Amen. And work. I remember one my preacher, <coughs> when, they, when I was in Bible school, the lecturer told us about this man. He said the car had stalled. And they needed to push the car. You know, the, in the old days, you know, when you had stick shift, and, and, you, and you push the car, and you put it in, you know what I'm saying, and you, it's, you get back into gear, and it goes, brr, 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 and then you start going. They needed that. But this one young preacher man said, my hands are promised to the gospel. He would not push it because his hands are promised to the gospel. Let me tell you, my friend, okay, just stay the next to the road. Amen. We'll pick you up tomorrow. But get your hands dirty sometimes. And that is how Jesus was. Jesus hung with the disciples, with the, the tax collectors. He hung with the sinners. He hung with the prostitutes. Not for bad reasons, obviously. But he hung with those. I like what Tommy Tenney says. He says, a, a shepherd must shall smell like sheep. If a shepherd does not smell like sheep, there's something wrong with him. He might not be a real shepherd. But a shepherd must smell like sheep. An evangelist must smell like a sinner. Amen. I'm not talking about hygienically. I'm just saying you've got to rub shoulders. You've got to be among them. Hallelujah. You've got to be among them. I said that this morning, but back in the day, uh, in Salisbury, there was, a, there was a tavern called the Cactus Tavern, I think. And I went to see the, I went to see the, the, the barman. I almost said the pastor, but the barman. And I, 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 and I, I told him, you know, at Saturday night, after 12, it was actually Sunday. I wasn't telling him to shut his business down. 
I said, but would you give me the opportunity to preach on Saturday? Uh, on Saturday after 12. So it's actually Sunday morning. Just 15 minutes. Now, he didn't give me the opportunity, and I understand why. It's not good for business. But you know what, my friends? That's where we should be. That's where we should be. Reinhard Bonnke, he was out in Germany. And they were driving, the pastor took them through Germany, and, they, and he showed them all the places, and they saw the bad part of town, and there was a disco. Back in the day, there was, you know, party places called the discos. And there's a disco. And they went in there, and they saw what was going on. It was at night. And Bonky looked at all these young people, discoing, dancing. And he saw how empty they were, without hope, without God, trying to fill the void, fill the void. And Bonky talked to the manager, and he said, please, could I preach to them? And they made an arrangement that tomorrow night, or Saturday night, he could preach to them after a certain time. And so he went out there. And he says he bought his first pair of jeans. He had never had jeans in his life. Never had jeans in his life. But his first pair of jeans. And when he got it, his daughter said, Dad, those jeans are out of style. The old folks' jeans. But anyhow, so he went there. And he started, he waited. And, he, and they finally, the manager, or whatever they call these disco owners, he made an announcement. Everybody... We got a um, preacher. We have to ask you for five minutes of your time. And let's listen to what he has to say. And he went and he took that mic and he preached the gospel. Within a few minutes, tears were rolling down the people's cheeks. And I forget the rest of what happened that night. But God did a wonderful thing. Well, a year later, Reiner Bonke is back with that same pastor. And he said, I've got something to show you. They went back to, they went back to that disco. And guess what it was? It was now a church. It was now a ministry. It was a, a, a one that reached out to the young people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look what the Lord has done. Yeah. Thinking about that, Bonke tells a story. He says they were in this place where it was the red light district. Have you ever been in a red light district? I remember when I was in, when I was in, first I was in, in, in Italy. And I got off and I walked, it was at night. And this woman talked to me in Italian. And I don't understand Italian, but all I knew, I got to run. <laughs> I got to run. But Bonky was in this place. And, uh, oh, I'm going to tell you another prostitute story real quick. This time was in Greece. So I'm walking out in Greece. And, uh, and, and, and this man comes to me. And he tells me, he says, uh, you know, uh, he wants to sell me a fur coat. A fur coat. Here I'm in Greece with a backpack. You know, I'm like young. I'm like 22 years old. Just roaming, no kids, no wife, just no mortgage, no nothing, no money even, just going everywhere preaching, wherever God opens the door. It was a great life. It's great to be young. Amen? And so, I'm here, this guy wants to sell me a fur coat. He says, for your wife. I said, I don't have a wife. He said, well, for your girlfriend. Do you have a girlfriend? I kind of saw the had one of you. I, I, I said, well, let's come. And he and he, and he said, come and at least see it. Just see the fur coat. So we finally went. I just thought, let me get this guy off my back. So we went to see his fur coat. Got into that place. When we got in there, everything was red. Red lights. I never even seen a real red, red light district in my life. And he sits me down. And he brings this blonde girl out. And he says, this is Joel. He's from South Africa. This is whatever her name was. And she sits there. I mean, it was love at first sight from her side. And she's looking at me. And, uh, and something in me said, this is not the place where you buy fur coats. <laughs> I, I got up as quick as I could. And I got out of that place. Amen. 
But back to Bonki. Bonki, he's got, he's in this red light district. And he sees all these things. You know, back in, in Holland, they have the girls out there in the, in the windows. You know, they stand there and they dance for you and they ask you to come in and whatever. I haven't seen that before, but, but, I, but, but Bonki says, when he looked at all of that, God gave him a good idea. He says he wants to rent a store in that area and paint the whole window black with one hole that's open and it's called the peeping hole the peeping hole and then large letters that say come and see the naked truth <laughs> and then you're supposed to look through the peeping hole and when you look through the peeping hole, there's a sign that says uh, something to the effect that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah! So what am I saying, my friends? we got to be among the sinners. we got to rub shoulders with them. Do you know that you can be in the world with, without being of it? Amen? You don't have to partake of them. And I'm not saying we should hang around the bars. These people actually have a ministry like that. I have no interest in, in that. If God gives me a chance, I'll go anywhere. I'll preach in a bar. I'll preach anywhere. But I'm not going to hang, hang there just because I want to hang. I don't like that. But I want to be where the sinners are. I want sinners to come to Jesus. We can't live in our little cocoon. we gotta, we got to open up to sinners. Remember, you and I are nothing but sinners saved by the grace of God, which now makes you no longer a sinner. You are now a child of the living God. Amen. That's why I, I don't say anymore that I'm, we're all just sinners. No, we're not all just sinners. We are all just saints. We once were lost, but now we found. We once were blind, but now we see. Do we mess up? Yes, we do. But you know, you don't sin anymore because of your sinful nature. You're just in this world which, which sometimes things happen. But you don't make a habit of it. And you don't celebrate it. That's the difference. When people celebrate, especially in the homosexual community, without just singling them out, but that's specifically this homosexual community, they specifically are proud of who they are. You cannot be proud of being a prostitute. You cannot be proud of being a liar. You cannot be proud of being a murderer. But in that sin is something that's very specific. Pride is, is a big thing. And then they say, God made me like this. And I'm brave. God made me like this. And I'm brave. I'm full of courage to get out of the closet and and just be who I am. No, my friends, that's not how you deal with sin. Sin must be repented of. Sin must, sinful flesh must be crucified. And it's one thing when the world has their sinful, but when the church revels in their sin, when people are saved, revel in their sin, and they don't repent of their sin, and they celebrate their sin, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. So Jesus hung with the tax collectors. And then, while he's hanging with the tax collectors and the sinners, the Bible tells us, as we just read in Matthew chapter 9, that the Pharisees, the self-righteous people, say to his disciples, why does your teacher, your rabbi, hang around the tax collectors and the sinners? But I love the answer of Jesus. He said, the sick need the physician. I did not come to treat the righteous, but the sick. Now, does that mean that the righteous, that the Pharisees were really righteous? No. They were self-righteous. And you know there's no hope for self-righteous people. Because in their own mind, they are righteous. In their own mind, there's nothing wrong. There's no hope for self-righteous people. Only when they get convicted and they realize that I'm 
I'm a rotten sinner myself. And you get rid of that self-righteous cloak and that mindset. And you realize I'm nothing but a sick man that needs the physician. I'm nothing but a diseased man that needs the doctor. I'm nothing but a wretch that needs amazing grace. Then their hearts can be opened to Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to those Pharisees, I've not come for the righteous. No, you're not really righteous. But I've not come for the self-righteous. I've come for the sinner, for those who know that they lost. Those who know that they lost. And that's my message here for you tonight. I want you to know Jesus is still Dr. Jesus. Dr. Jesus, amen. Dr. Jesus Christu, amen. Yeshua, praise God. Dr. Jesus is still in the office. Dr. Jesus is still in the healing business. Dr. Jesus is still in the healing Jesus. Like that song says, what a healing Jesus I found in you. That's what Jesus still, still does for a, a business. And we got to rub our shoulders with the world. We must love those that Jesus died for. We love to sing, break my heart with what breaks yours. But do we love that? Is our hearts really broken with the things that breaks God's heart? I close with this tonight. I'm telling you, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I cannot, I've got three sons. I got three sons and I'm not willing to give one of them. And I got one daughter, I'm not willing to give her. Amen. Dr. Mark Swiger, a great friend of mine at Crusades in, in India, probably more Crusades than any other man in 10 years that he was there until he was banned from the country. But this is what he would do. He would preach and he said, I'll do anything for you. And he'd take his tie off and he'd throw it in there. Who wants my tie? And then he'd take his jacket off. He said, I'll do anything for you. Amen. And he frees here with the rest of you. And he'd throw his jacket off. Who wants my jacket? Amen. And then he took his shoes off. I want these shoes back, please. Amen. And he threw them. And he take his other jacket off. No, I cannot do that because I'm getting cold. Go ahead, shoot. I feel getting cold. Amen. And he, he'd do those things. And, and, uh, and he, he said, I'll take it. And he let me do that. He threw his jacket, his suit, and whatever. Until he was standing there in his underwear only. No, he wouldn't do that. He didn't go that far. But, but he, he, he'd do that. He said, I'll do anything for you. But then, he said, but there's one thing that I will never do for you. I've got one son. I only have one child in America. And I will never give you my son. I will never give you my son. He, he even mortgaged his house. He had a house which he mortgaged. And he took, I think, $50,000 cash out. And he used that to fund these crusades in India. That's what he did. He said, I, I, I mortgaged my house to preach this crusade to you. Then the Lord gave him lots of donors and he was able to, you know, continue that. But uh, did you know what, my friends? He would not give his son. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son. And if he gave his only begotten son, that's how much he loves souls. That's how much he loves people. He loves people. Jesus is not out there to try to, to find a loophole to get you or them to hell. You know, I don't understand eternal security and I don't understand the, the election pre, predestination. I've studied some of it. It's some of it. And my, I just, it's above my head. I, I, I can't get it. I studied left and right. I just can't get some stuff. I mean, it's okay. Some things you just don't understand. 
And I don't get some of all these. But you know what, my friends? What I do know is Jesus loves people. And I know that God gave His Son for us. And if God gave His Son for this world, we should give our passion. We should give our heart. We should give our money. We should give our focus. We should make our life about Jesus. About Jesus winning souls. About Jesus bringing souls to Jesus. One day when we go to heaven, we can't take anything of this world with us. We can't take nothing with us. We cannot take anything. No money. We can't take anything with us. But we can take the souls we want for Jesus with us. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Mine is a life that was saved. You don't know how many souls you've saved. You know, every time you've supported a missionary or whatever, you have no idea. But one day when you get up there, like that song says, are they lined? You know that song I just sang? Thank you for giving to the Lord. You know who sang that? Ray Bolts. How many of you know Ray, Ray Bolts? What a powerful, fantastic singer. My heart breaks. Because he divorced his wife and he went the homosexual lifestyle. A man like that. What, what, what a fantastic, fantastic singer. I mean, he, he, you know many of his songs. You know, amazing. And I Lord, I just pray right now for Ray Bolts. Yeah. We're not condemning him, Lord. We, we, we weep for him. We cry for him. We ask you, Lord, bring him back to the cross. Bring him back to Jesus. Bring him home, Lord, in the name of Jesus. <coughs> so, Lord, tonight, as I conclude this service, Father, I pray that you put in us the same spirit as Jesus Christ not the self-righteous spirit not the one that says I have no sin not the one that says well I have sinned but only little because Lord it doesn't matter sinners are deservant of the wrath of God for we rebelled against you but Lord you love us so much that you gave your son. And in reality, when we dissect that, it was really God himself in human form. That's what it means, the son of God. God himself in human form. When God gave his son, God was really giving himself. And Father, we pray that we'll be like Jesus, who could tell the lost, follow me. And we tell people, follow Jesus. With a magnetism and a power in our personality that is not our own, but is only anointed by the Holy Ghost and power. And Lord, we pray that we will bring people to the physician, Dr. Jesus. There are people who need you, Lord. People need the Lord, that song says. People need the Lord. We pray, Lord, for the people on the street, Sand Hill Road. Let them know Jesus. Lord, I pray for every person that I've invited. I haven't invited too many on this road, but here and there I've stopped at a stranger's house or a person I know's house. God, I pray that those seeds will find its way. And I pray that they'll come to the Lord and come to church and come to River City Church. Father, not only Sand Hill Road, but the world is our mission field. All of Sussex County, all of Delaware. Lord, let them come from Kentucky. Amen. Let them come to River City Church in Delaware from Kentucky. I don't know why I said that. Maybe it's the Lord. But Lord, bring them in. Bring them in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, bring souls in. Lord, bring souls in. Bring the souls in. In the mighty name of Jesus.